Welcome everyone to another episode of IGN Unfiltered, our monthly interview series where we get to sit down with the best, brightest, most fascinating minds in the games industry. And uh, the minds don't get much more fascinating or, uh, or uh, more important this day and age than Eve Guillemot, the president, the CEO, the co-founder and chairman, many titles on the business card for Eve. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Very kind of you to, to, to come here. You've, uh, as we record today, you've just come from Google and uh, Stadia, and you guys were a big, big uh, early partner in that. And we'll we'll get to that later. There's so much to cover with you, but uh, you don't you don't do many of these interviews with us media schlubs too often. So I get to, I, I'm so blessed to have this chance here. But I want I always like to start at the beginning. You know, you you co-founded Ubisoft uh, with your brothers in 1986. Yeah. Uh, you left your left your family's farming support, farming equipment business behind. Do I have that correct? It's uh, <clears throat> they were dealing with uh, farmers, okay. uh, where they were buying their what they were creating, and uh, and selling them stuff to, so to what, make them happen. So it's over thirty. What what motivates you in the eighties to to get into the video game business, which is you know if, I think most of our audience probably isn't that old, but that's I mean that's a that's a seemingly a very risky thing to do. Video games were not the business they are now. You know, it's it's really because um, my father's and mother's business was mm, in front of mm, challenges, I would say, and uh, we had to deal with, um, with our parents. They were paying for our studies, but we had to give one year each of us had to give one year to the to the company. Oh wow! And uh, my brother Michel, when he came back, he looked at other businesses and he found video games. Hmm. So, ha were you were you a gamer at all? Did you play any what Nintendo or Atari? Were you familiar with, with we, the industry at all? We didn't have access to that many machines. We we were playing arcade games yeah. in, uh, in bars, and uh, we loved. We actually had lots of fun doing it, you know, Space Invaders and Commando, Ghost and Goblins. All those games were part of our day to day. So it sounds like your parents were very uh, encouraging. I mean, this is this is a, a seemingly a something of a risky venture of oh, I you know, computer software, video games, and the fact that they they had they had built their own business. Um, they 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 didn't tell you you were you were crazy, seemingly. No, no, they, um, I, I remember uh, when my brother started, because he started by doing a mail order uh, company inside uh, the group. But after that, when we created Ubisoft, uh, it was less, um, he, he preferred commerce to um, being creating things. Right, right. And so when I started Ubisoft, he was wondering if it was the right thing to do because he had been doing more business with other parties before. So uh, the I think it's fair to say the the first the original mascot uh, as it were of, of Ubisoft was Rayman. Exactly. When did you first meet Michel Ancel? It was very he was very young, wasn't he? He was very young. He was seventeen years old. Wow. Uh, when he he came to work uh, in Brittany, uh, west of France, uh, he read articles and he wanted to to meet with my other brother Gerard, who created a small uh, unit in um, near the, our own town, and <clears throat> he came and he showed what he was able to create. So he stayed with uh, in there for a while, and then we. We created something that uh, has been uh, famous in the industry uh, uh, for, for a while now. It's we, we wanted all the external uh, creators to, to, to work in one place. So we rented a castle in Brittany wow. and Michel was a, came to the castle uh, from time to time to, to work with the other um, uh, teams there trying to create uh, Iron Lord at the time or Buffy Saga or games that many people uh, don't remember about. Well, I, I just learned actually in researching this, this interview that uh, Zombie was one of your first titles. And so I never made the connection that Zombie U from the Wii U was like a spiritual exactly. successor to that game. I learned that in, uh, in preparing for this. I thought that was great. No, no, Zombie was, um, it was a, a very interesting um, experience because the, it took us quite a while to create it and uh, when we launched it we only sold 600 units you wow. know so 
We said, ah, after two years of hard work, um, it's, it doesn't it's, it doesn't seem to pay off as much as we expected. And over time, uh, Zombie was at first on Amstrad uh, CPC, then it mm -hmm. went on Commodore uh, 64. Uh, and we were able to actually to continue to sell it for uh, six or seven years. So it's, it helped really to go from France to Germany to UK and then to, to, to the world. Right. Let's go back to Rayman for a second. When, uh, did you have any sense right away that Michel Ansel was, was special? Did you just kind of get, sense that right? Or, or did it sort of, did he really just, I mean, of course he's grown over time, but, but uh, was it a, right away you knew there was something with him? Yeah, when my brother uh, met him, he was 17 years old. So uh, he was not supposed to hire a guy of that age. And, uh, but he was fascinated by Michel from the beginning. And um, he came back then to Paris because we had to regroup uh, the team in Paris because uh, uh, we wanted to, to create studios in Paris. And he st Michel stayed in Paris for a while, but he thought it, living in a city was um, problematic for him, so he went in Montpellier and uh, we, we did continue to work with him and that's how Rayman was created. A part in Montpellier, south of France, yeah. and a part in, uh, in Paris. And, now, and you still have studios in Montpellier now. Yes, we do. Yeah, it's, and it, it's, it's done great work over the years. Exactly, and it, be, it, it became, uh, um, uh, it is now a city with lots of small studios and, and big ones. Uh, so Rayman, you know, being kind of the original mascot of the company, what, what has Rayman meant to, to you personally and, and to Ubisoft over the years? Oh, Rayman for us was uh, a way to, um, to to change the profile of the company. We um, we started Rayman on uh, the Jaguar. We, we are just... Yeah, we, we were just talking machine. before we came on. Yeah, I didn't realize that you'd started it on the Atari Jaguar. That's right. And we, we spoke at that time with the Tramiel uh, Brothers. Um, but when the Jaguar, the Jaguar was not coming uh, fast to the market and Sony came with the PS1. Right. And so we saw an opportunity to also port the game on uh, PlayStation and we developed it a lot on, the, on PlayStation and launched it uh, worldwide, including Japan and the US with the launch of the machine. And that was totally new for our first steps in creating studios. And it's interesting that, that you say that, you just made because it's something I've noticed about Ubisoft over the years, even very recent years as well, is Ubisoft seems to embrace every new platform launch, whatever it is, whether it's Google Stadia or, or the Wii or the Wii U or the Vita. Uh, you guys always seem to have titles at launch ready to go, whereas other publishers we see maybe will will wait back and wait for uh, a user base to develop. With, it, what is your sort of overall strategy with with uh, with with new platforms? If we go back, you know, when we started in the industry, we 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 uh, arrived after some machines. Um, you know, some machines were really Commodore 64, Spectrum were quite big. Yeah. But when we wanted to create games on those machines, it was quite difficult. So what with the Amstrad, we started the company and and then we started to work on Nintendo. And when we went on the NES, there were too many products. So we couldn't really um, grow uh, right. on, on that uh, machine. So we, we thought coming with something new, so a, a new machine is giving you many possibilities. First, your game will be new because it's a new, the machine has capacities that right. others didn't have. Your team is going to be able to take more risk because people, the, the, the players are going to try new things. So you can be more innovative. And as we did it with um, fir the first time with the Amstrad and then with the, um, the PlayStation, we really realized how important it could be for the company to, to do that. And then after each, the launch of each console, we, want, we created new brands and uh, it gave us uh, the possibility to expand uh, worldwide. So speaking of, of uh, taking risks and being creative uh, and, and also bringing it back to Michel Ancel, 
Uh, Beyond Good and Evil 2 is a game that this very dedicated group of, of vocal fans have been wanting for over 10 years, and finally, it was announced. So what, what did it take for that game to finally be greenlit into development? Does, it, it, does Michel have extra leeway with you, given his history with the company? It's, you know, after such a long wait, how, how did uh, Beyond Good and Evil 2 finally get the, get the, the okay to go? You know, planets had to be aligned, and uh, so Michel wanted to do all sorts of uh, things. You know, we did uh, Rayman Legend, Rayman Origin. He, he did quite a few things um, uh, after uh, Beyond Good and Evil, uh, like uh, also um, <coughs> uh, an another uh, type of game that didn't w didn't come to the the market, and uh, then King Kong. So after all those years, you know, he, he wanted to do other things before going to a sequel. Mm -hmm. And uh, we convinced him that uh, it could be the right time. But he, he was able to, in working on it, to come with something that, uh, that was very impressive. So then all the planets were aligned and the teams were ready to, to work with him on this product. So you, you, the Ubisoft had to t convince him a little bit that it was time. Not right. the, I would have assumed it was the other way around, that he came to you and said, let's go. It's, it's uh, always a combination yeah. of, uh, of you know, decisions and uh, we have to convince each other that it is the, the right time. Uh, but Michel... Um, you know, because when he, he takes that kind of work, he, he puts all his energy in, in it. Uh, we have to make sure he's ready. And uh, he has to agree that he will spend a lot of years in in developing those games. And and how's that project coming along? I know we, when was the last time you saw it? We publicly haven't seen it for a good, what, year and a half now. How, how, when was the last time you saw it? It it's um, I spoke with Michel actually last week about it to to see where it was going, what we how we you know should move in 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 one or one or another direction, and and we 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 see that uh, the potential of uh, this universe is is fantastic, and Michel is really passionate passionate by it. So it's it's going to be fantastic, I think. Excellent. Well. You talk about Rayman putting the company on the map. Um, for me, I, as someone, I've I've covered games for 16 years now and played them much longer than that. For me, I feel like uh, the move that really lifted Ubisoft into the big time was the partnership with Tom Clancy and the Tom Clancy brand. That, for me, is when you guys kind of went from uh, the Rayman guys to a serious player, and maybe you disagree with that. I don't no, know. No, it was a big movie. Yeah, but sure. um, I wanted to ask you about that. How? How did? So that was the year. That was two thousand uh, mm -hmm. with Red Storm and and Ghost Recon. Um, where? Or maybe it was Rainbow Six first. I can't quite remember. But how did? How did the relationship with with Tom Clancy and the and the Clancy brand come about? So it's, it was, um, we, we first did, uh, bought a small studio in uh, North, Carolina, uh, North Carolina, and um, the head of that studio knew the, the, the people at Red Storm. Interesting. And uh, <clears throat> as it, during those years, the, 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 I'm going to be a bit technical, but the, the multiples of value and the multiple of profit uh, that uh, created the value of companies were different in Europe and in America. So in America, the business was less hyped, I would say. So it, they, they were more in the eight to 10 multiples of their profit. Okay. And in Europe, we were more at 15, 20. So it, during that time, so when Redstone went around, uh, to find a partner, uh, they they couldn't find a partner at the level at the value they wanted. Right, and it was easier for us to buy a company uh, on a higher at a higher price, I would say, than our colleagues, and that's how it. Uh, that's how the conversation started. Mm. Then we we had uh, very good meetings, and we we s automatically uh, saw the potential of uh, the Clancy brand and all the work that Redstone was doing, which was 
fantastic work. And uh, that's what how it happened. And yes, it changed the company quite a lot. Yeah, it's uh, you ended up buying the entire Clancy rights outright in 2008. Uh, and that deal seems like it's proven to be a, a very good one for you. It's working well, I would say. <laughs> um, what I, I got? I'm, what's your favorite of the of the Clancy games? Do you have a favorite? It's difficult for me to say that because, as you know, we have uh, different teams working on all those uh, <laughs> uh, games. And uh, no, we what we can say is the first one that uh, that changed uh, a lot. The company was uh, Splinter Cell, where. You know, we went for the the Xbox, yes, and it was a complex bet because and dangerous bet because the, 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 they right, the didn't have many small, machines, yeah. and um, <clears throat> coming on that machine and not on PlayStation at that time was uh, was um, a bit risky. But we we couldn't go straight on PlayStation. We wanted to use the the capacity of the machine uh, and. We first came on Xbox. We did very well on Xbox. At, we did probably 50% of the install base. Wow. Uh, and, and then we were able, uh, with our studio in China, to port it on, on PlayStation. And that's how it became a bigger brand in the Well, industry. you talk about taking creative risks and being able to have more technical room to play with on new platforms. And Splinter Cell is a great example of, of, a, of that bet paying off. Exactly. And I'm glad you said Splinter Cell because that's my favorite ah, cool. Clancy game by, by a lot. I, I do like them all, but um, so I, I have to ask, what, you know, you were asked, you, you, you get asked about Splinter Cell anytime people like me can sit you down, but why has it been <laughs> dormant? Where has it been for so long? Uh, um, <clears throat> because each time you, you have to, um, when you create a, a game, you have to make sure you will uh, come with something that will be different enough sure. from what you, you did before. And um, the, the last time we did a Splinter Cell, we, we had lots of uh, pressure from uh, all the, um, the, the fans actually saying, don't change it, don't do this, don't do that. And um, <clears throat> so some of the teams are more were more anxious to, to work on the, on the, on the brand. Now we, they, they are some some things and that uh, some people that are now looking at uh, at the brand, looking taking care of the brand. Uh, so at one point you will see something, but I can't say more than that. <laughs> uh, but so because also of Assassin's Creed and all the other uh, brands taking off. Um, people wanted to to work on those brands more, so it's we we have to follow what right limited they like resources. To do. That's yeah, right. yeah, because it's you know I, Clint Hawking works at Ubisoft again, and uh, Michael Ironside has returned and appeared as as Sam Fisher in exactly. Ghost Recon uh, the, the, the that uh, extra the downloadable content. content. Mm -hmm. You you can't you can't tease us like that and then not have a new Splinter <laughs> Cell true, game. We do have new consoles coming up, Eve. I don't know if you know this, <laughs> but <laughs> I, I heard think about it's, that. It's time for Splinter Cell to return on the new consoles, please. I take the message. <laughs> Thank you. That's that's all I that's all I came here to say. Really, no. Um, uh, but actually, before I move on from Splinter Cell, <clears throat> what's going on with the Splinter Cell movie? That's, uh, you know, you guys have, have uh, dabbled now in, in film, mm -hmm. uh, and Splinter Cell, a, a, a movie was announced some time ago. Is, is that still a project you guys are out it's, working on? It's still on the way, um, but uh, with Hollywood, um, you may, you may see lots of movies are on the verge of being done, but uh, very often that it, it's taking forever for on on lots of projects. So this one is we still have a a scenario, but it's it's not in the making at the moment. I would say. Right. Is there how how involved? You know, I know you you, you went through and Prince of Persia was finished and released, and so with with Splinter Cell uh, being in development but not you know filming right now. How how active a role do do you? Uh, want the company to take in that? Do you think just leave it to the to the Hollywood studio, or or would you do you want to see your teams uh, have a, have an active voice in it? 
what what we what the way we do it is we create a scenario we we look at the cast and then we go to a studio because we we want the um, the characters we want the, the the story to be really linked with what we we created in the games and so that's the the, the way we we act and then with the studio we rework uh, but we rework for something that fits with the our creation teams yeah i mean we <clears throat> is after prince of persia and now uh, splinter sun in development you know it is is movie making uh, something a way you want to expand Ubisoft's reach or you know we see Activision wants to do a Call of Duty cinematic universe do you see film as a as a as a next area of growth for Ubisoft or are you still trying to just experiment with it right now Actually um, what we are looking at first is doing the best games uh, on earth so that that's really our main focus after that um, if some characters some uh, universes that we create can have a uh, another life um, then we go for it but uh, the, the strategy is really to make sure we first create the best games possible well that's that's a good answer that's a, this audience will like that answer um, so sh shifting gears here uh, you you know Ubisoft I think was really the first company to really begin tapping into the well of talent in Montreal mm -hmm. uh, and you have a very large presence in Montreal can you talk about your relationship with the city? I mean, I know there there are, I believe I've heard there are sort of tax incentives to 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 incentivize game development and job creation there. But but what 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 drew you to Montreal and what uh, what keeps you what what makes that such an important city for Ubisoft? Uh, it's it is, it's a long story. So, but I we have time. You, it's <laughs> what happened when I was eighteen years old. I. Um, I, I came in America for a trip and uh, um, we, I arrived alone and I met a few, some friends and we each hiked on the, on the bridge in New York and we went to, to Quebec because somebody on the, on the, uh, on the, on the bridge uh, wanted to, to, to go for the weekend in right. Quebec. So we went with that person. So that's how I learned about um, Montreal and Quebec City. And Ten years later, um, I was called by a guy saying, "You know, we we think you should come to uh, to Montreal. Uh, we can give you subsidies. Uh, you know, uh, twenty five thousand dollars per person during five years. Right. So, so why don't you come?" We said, mm, "Subsidies? We we are not, you know, f fun uh, fun of." Um, uh, of subsidies because we sometimes government come and they give and then they take them back so but he said yeah give me one meeting you come and I try to convince you and uh, and uh, I will organize meetings with some of the, the politicians there yeah so we did that with my brother Michel we went to to Quebec and he convinced us to to actually um, invest in the in the city and that's how it, it happened, as simply as that. And that has that has uh, proven to be very fruitful for you. Yeah, it was it was very good because we we could first. I I love that city. Um, you know, when I, I went there, I fall in love with uh, Montreal and, and Quebec, and so I I was interested to go to go back uh, because I loved the people there. Yeah. They, 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 uh, I fall in love with the people when I go uh, went there. So. Creating that studio was a was a delight for me. And it, and Montreal has proven to be arguably your most fruitful uh, studio. Uh, Splinter Cell originally came out of there. Yes. Uh, Rainbow Six for for many years came mm -hmm. out of uh, Montreal. It still does. Uh, Assassin's Creed originally came out of Montreal. I mean that's that's a lot of success out of out of springing from one studio. Yeah, yeah, and even Prince of Persia. Prince of Persia, of course, as but, well. Another game we need to, come, yeah. to have come back. <laughs> <laughs> when we we took him uh, took it from um, from the company we bought from Border Boon right. at that time, um, we we took it to Montreal and they did a good job with it. Yes, for sure. Uh, so, <clears throat> if if Ubisoft games do get the portfolio in general, maybe gets one bit of general criticism, it's that. 
there are a lot of open world games in the, in the Ubisoft portfolio. You know, not all of them, For Honor and South Park, uh, Rainbow Six certainly, but you know, Assassin's Creed, Ghost Recon, The Division, Watch Dogs. Do you ever worry about, about the portfolio of the, of the company's games falling into uh, something like that where there, there's a little bit of overlap? In fact, what we try to do is to, to give as much freedom as possible to, to players. And for us, open worlds are well adapted to that. Now you need to make sure your open world is uh, filled with lots of interesting things to do. Yeah. And um, so we continuously work on that to make sure that our games um, give as much fun as possible and also uh, something to play for everyone. So the possibility to, to do what you want to do. And step by step, you will see we will increase the, those uh, uh, possibilities to, to really have the experience you want. So that it's, um, but it's step by step, yeah. I would say. Is, uh, how, how important is the, you know, open world games do allow more easily, I think, for microtransactions and post-release content and, and budgets for games are getting uh, larger every year. And so um, is, that a con is that a consideration, the, the sort of amount of money you can make after a game has been released? How important of a consideration is that when, when greenlighting a project, say a, you know, something fairly linear like a uh, I guess South, South Park's a decent example, even though there's been some content for that, but, you know, versus a Division 2. You know, what, what, what does, I guess what I'm trying to say is, what does that, that post, the, the tail of a game and, and the earning potential there look like when you're, when you're looking at, when you're evaluating what games to say yes to, to Greenlight? So what we, <clears throat> because we, put a lot of uh, time and efforts to create a universe, uh, cities uh, and worlds. What we, we try to do is to, to give um, possibilities to, to stay there for a long time uh, with lots of um, different gameplay and the possibility to play with your friends. Sure. Uh, so um, it, it's more wide why do you want to redo everything every year if you can uh, improve uh, the experience and increase the imp experience in one game? So right. uh, Division, you know, was just launched, and uh, um, and now we are working on you know the, the next couple of years of content so that it will it will be played uh, by many people that will. Uh, master the, the, all the, the systems and will be able to have a, a lot of fun in it. And it's easier for us to improve, increase the, the, the number of possibilities that the game can bring than restart from, from scratch. So I, I would say it's more, yes, we need also to, to have a little bit of monetization in those games so that it can pay for the content sure. all the teams are doing. Um, but you you can do better when you don't have to redo everything. I would say makes sense. I mean, look at I think Rainbow Six Siege is is an incredible example. They're on I believe year four yes. of their content now. Exactly. Uh, is that is that even a game anymore to you? And what I mean by that is is it is it a platform now? We we can say it's a platform, but at the same time the the gameplay is remains the same. They, we, they are variation, variations of uh, with all the new operators coming and right. so on, but um, we, we still follow you know, some rules that we, we had from the beginning. Like, do you even, I'm not fishing here, I promise, but do you even need a Rainbow Six Siege 2? Or do you just, with, with what, 30, I think, million players, something like this in Rainbow Six Siege, do you, do you just add to that? In fact, the Rainbow Six brand itself can still deliver different types of gameplay. Uh, but on the Siege side, you know, at the moment, if we can adapt to all the new machines and uh, the new possibilities that uh, are becoming available via right. all the new technologies uh, that, uh, that come, we, we can continue to improve the experience and give more diversity. And I think I don't see why we should stop. 
Well, one game that, that I want to have to ask you about that, that is very different than anything we've, we've been talking about, uh, Mario and Rabbids. Yes. Uh, this is a, it, it is so rare to have a collaboration with Nintendo and Miyamoto himself. Who, I, I have to know, who first told you about it? Um, and do, to, to make that partnership happen, do conversations go all the way up to you? Or I, just can you kind of sort of tell me about how that came to be from your perspective? Yes, yes, it comes to me for sure. Uh, we, because it's, it's really not only a game, it's, it's really a relationship, uh, a, a collaboration with, yes. uh, with Nintendo. And um, no, the, the way it happened is uh, our teams, you know, the, the teams um, at Ubisoft have always been so impressed by what Nintendo uh, was doing that they, they wanted to collaborate with uh, Nintendo. And we, we did so with in being early on all the machines Nintendo did. And uh, we, we did a lot on the Wii, if you remember, mm -hmm. and the Wii Red U. Red Steel, yeah. And, um, <clears throat> and so the... the the optimal uh, relationship that we could have was to to work with Mr. Miyamoto, uh, and um, for for us having that possibility was uh, fantastic because you can learn um, how he does things, you you can get feedback on everything you do. Uh, so that has been an experience that was that has been really cool for all the members of the company, I would say. And so that's why it was a discussion we had uh, Mr. with Mr. Iwata, with, uh, um, with Takao, with uh, the, the person who is uh, organizing the relation between Ubisoft and, uh, and Nintendo. And so <clears throat> it has been, um, I would say, a long discussion and we had to convince also Miyamoto with uh, what we were showing, what we, we could do. And step by step, they opened the door uh, for us to, to do the Mario Rabbids. Uh, so did, part. did you end up, did you end up speaking personally with, with Iwata-san and, and Miyamoto-san? Yes, oh. yes, sure. That's, that's cool. So, it, and, do, and during development then, do you keep a, cl a little closer eye on, on that game than you might another project? We we have. Uh, a close, I know you trust your teams, I, but <laughs> uh, no, on on everything we the way you know we have uh, gates. Uh, so I participate to all the gates of the different games we create, and you know this one yes for sure was uh, uh, had a lot of attention uh, because it was something totally different from what we were doing. But yeah. it was smooth actually. It went it went very well. The relationship was well established, and and as for our teams, it was um, you know working with God. It, it it was something that they were spending lots of time to make sure it could be perfect. So at at E three when the game is revealed, and you see the director of the project, Davide Soliani, become overwhelmed with emotion as Miyamoto is is speaking about the game on stage. What what's what was your reaction when you when you saw it? I don't know if you were backstage and I don't know if you saw it, but or see it. You see the video later, and do you speak with Davide afterwards? Can can you kind of explain that? It was such a wonderful moment. It it was a wonderful moment, and it was a wonderful moment for me too because uh, um, seeing a, a person that was a fan of Nintendo being able to create uh, something that was recognized by uh, Mr. Miyamoto was something that gave me a lot of um, um, proudness, I would say. I, I was really proud uh, to see that that kind of thing could happen. Uh, and when a person from Ubisoft is happy, I'm always extremely happy. Uh, please tell me, is, so is, is it, can, will this partnership continue? Could we, I, I'd love to see another another Mario and Rabbids game. Yeah, we can't say <laughs> much today, but uh, they, they, we had a good relationship. So let's see what- Fingers crossed. Can. Um, I want to talk about Assassin's Creed for a moment. When, when Patrice, Desile, Jade Raymond and their team, uh, when you first saw Assassin's Creed, you just mentioned you, you participate in all the, the gates of a project, you are seeing it along the way. Uh, did you know right away that Assassin's Creed would, was going to be special? The, the first uh, demo we saw was, uh, was really cool. And um, 
you, you, you have to know that at first, you know, it, it, it became as another project and it, it, that project became Assassin's Creed because the, um, the animation, the, the open world um, gave so much more possibilities that uh, we, we saw we, we could create a brand, um, a, a totally new brand uh, than what it was what it was started on. Well, what, what, well, what did it start out as then? Prince of Persia. Really? Yes. Okay. I don't know if I've, maybe that story's been out there. I don't know. I never knew that. That's no, no, really it's, interesting. It's, I don't, few people know that. but it, <laughs> that's, that's cool. Um, so Assassin's Creed has, has uh, largely been an annualized release. Um, a lot of your primary publishing competitors are, are do regular annual releases. Are they a necessary business evil? Do you think, do you, would, would you prefer that a series take time off from time to time or, or do you just let the market tell you what, what is okay? And when, what we, what we um, see is that when a team can create something exceptional, um, if two teams are close, like it happened for, for Origin and Dynasty, right. it's, it doesn't matter. Otherwise, what we try is to, to make sure we can come every two years or three years on with a brand. Yeah, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. Now, um, I want to ask you, this is the, you're the perfect person to speak, who better than the CEO. When, when it became clear that, that EA and then later Vivendi were, were looking to initiate what you interpreted as a hostile corporate takeover, um, how, as the, the co-founder of the company, the CEO, the chairman, how do you react to that? Is it, do you start freaking out? Are you complimented in some weird way that, that someone's trying to just get in and, and get this thing you built? How, how, how do you handle Sort of personally, when that when something like that happens, you you always freak out, freaked out, <laughs> freak out, um, because you you it's a fight. So you start a fight, and uh, you with the the ultimate goal of you know continuing to do the the, the business like you did before. And uh, my role is to defend um, my the the freedom of uh, of the the teams working in the company, uh, so that they they really can create the games that uh, that we 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 come with so and I think that the only way to do that uh, is to to be able to take risk to fail from time to time uh, and that is not easy to do in huge companies so when you are attacked with a company that has a different philosophy you know it can affect um, what you've been creating from from scratch uh, so you fight with a lot of energy to to make sure it, it can't be destroyed when so EA was the first one to try yes um, did you learn a lot from that experience to help when Vivendi tried later, it's you know like for everything <laughs> like in video games, you know you you've done it for before, so you 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 all. I think it's still a big fight, but you you've done you've you've been there already, so you you get organized faster, and uh, as you succeeded already once, you. It gives you more energy to say we did it once, right. so we can win again. Like, does it just piss you off when that? Does it just like leave me alone? Like, why <laughs> is it? Is it? Do you get angry, or or do you just do you just hunker down and probably call a lot of lawyers and say, all right, let's go? Like, what what how, what's your sort of personal attitude when when those things happen? Well, first is as I said, you you you're a bit sad um, that. It's happening to you now that uh, uh, you you had a, a lot of work to do and uh, lots of opportunities, um, but uh, very quickly you come to okay, what is uh, what is our strategy? Yeah. It's like a challenge, uh, a new challenge that you have to face, and as we we are very close at Ubisoft, we we can uh, really we could really work on different types of strategies, analyzing uh, the, the competitor, um, the opponent, and, and define. Um, so you, you more work on what is going to help you to succeed than um, 
then you know say uh, it's it's difficult f and and so so it's it's more we go for the strategy and and, and we fight and it, and it, when it's over do you is it just relief or do you feel like really good is it is it is it invigorating or is it just Okay, that's over. No, it's really invigorating. Yeah, and it, and not only um, the CEO, it's invigorating all the team that worked hard to make it happen. And this time uh, with the the Vivian D episode, we we like with the EA, but um, we we were all the team uh, working hard to make sure it couldn't happen. So. Among the major game publishers now, Ubisoft, if I have this fact correct, the fourth largest publicly traded game company in the Americas and Europe after Activision Blizzard, EA, and Take-Two as far as revenue and market capitalization. So most of the major uh, criteria. So I, I share the opinion personally of, of a lot of uh, gamers that, that Ubisoft is really the most creatively friendly publisher on that list. You, Ubisoft has allowed projects to remain in development for many, many years uh, or be rebooted or or like sit, Splinter Cell has sat idle for a while and many other publishers would say, no, just get one out every year. Uh, Rainbow Six w was another famous one. It sat idle for many years yeah. after uh, lo three and then lockdown, Black Arrow lockdown and there was Patriots and that was shelled before Siege came around. So how do you, as the, the CEO of the company, when you're trying to ensure the health of the company f uh, financially, make sure everyone can keep jobs and continue to, to do what they do, how do you manage the balance of creativity with, with the reality of making sound financial decisions? Right, it's, a, it's a good question. It's it's really part of the job of uh, of my job, um, and with with my team for sure. Uh, what we when we feel that we have a good team um, and that they 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 are really um, they are really on something that can become excellent. Um, we give them more, t you know, as much time as we can. You know, there's, as you said, some pressure to deliver uh, a good turnover and profit every year. But uh, my my job is really to to give enough time to our teams, um, because what I saw is that each time you are able to make them win, um, they they can win the next battle as well. So it's, it's really a question of, okay, I believe that I'm going to have the time, the need, the, 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 all the, the, the resources, the, the resources to, to make it happen. So even if I make a mistake, I can try other things. So it, it helps our teams to, to take more risk. Right. Sometimes it's, it's, it's not good risk, but uh, at the end of the day, that's, I think what I've seen in, in the long run I've been in the company is that when you have people that are very smart and with a lot of passion, giving them time is the best way to, to come with something that will be profitable. I mean, I don't know if you can answer this question because you've been at Ubisoft for 30 plus years and not other companies, but do you think or know from speaking with other executives, other game publishers, would you say, do you think Ubisoft cancels fewer projects internally than than other publishers? I know every publisher, things don't work, and but do, would you, do you think your cancellation rate would might be lower than, than other companies? It, it may be lower, but you, we don't know exactly how right. it's, uh, <laughs> what's happening in, in companies. Uh, uh, Blizzard doesn't seem to, to cancel uh, many games. True. So, um, I think we we are just believing in people uh, and and believe in, in talent and that's that's how we we try to to create good games. Well, on, on that note, I do want to ask you uh, wh what happened to the UB Art framework with the, that initiative. You know, we saw Valiant Hearts, uh, we saw a few really interesting mm -hmm. games come out of that, but it, I feel like we we haven't heard anything about about that in some time. Is that still? It's the the you know that's how was created. Well, Rayman uh, Origin and Legend were created, and Valiant Heart, as you as you said, um, 
we it's the the tools were difficult to use so okay. at one point we wanted to give them to everybody but uh, as they were difficult to use we said we are going to spend uh, a lot of time with a lot of people to actually give um, you know help people to use it right. so so we said we 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 can't we can't take it, give it to everyone um so it's still there, and uh, you will see other things uh, using it, but it's not as predominant as it used to be. So speaking more about kind of the business, uh, Ubisoft as, as a whole, um, do you feel, are, are games as a service viable long-term? And is the $60 game viable long-term? When you see a, a Fortnite and you see an Apex Legends, um, what do you think when you see these huge successes of, of these free-to-play games? And, and, and how do you sort of look at that as, as you map the future of Ubisoft? In fact, what, what I see is that uh, when somebody comes with a very good game, uh, is taking the time uh, players want to spend on those games. And uh, the competition is not in how you monetize. The competition is how do you give players um, an experience that will be f better than what the other guys are doing or giving um, and i think our job is to really um, give the best experience uh, as possible and uh, the battle royale uh, genre came with new new emotions new sets of emotions and uh, and so the fact that you can play with lots of your friends and uh, that it's a very social experience is something that we have to to bring more in all the games we create. But what I, I think is um, creating the best experience can make people want to buy for sixty dollars. If if you have something exceptional, they will come and they will pay for it. Well, what and. Battle Royale, it, it is a genre now. It is a very real thing. And uh, we, you've seen, you know, it started with the, the PUBGs of the world. and But now you're seeing Call of Duty get in there and, and uh, Battlefield get in there. Do you, uh, I suppose, do you, you probably don't mandate to your teams, hey, f let's find a Battle Royale. Do you, do you wait for the teams to pitch you on something that might be a good fit in that space? What we really look is uh, what those gameplay bring bring you know how, wh why are they so interesting it, it so it's not automatically a battle royale that you have to do but you have to take all the ingredients that make um, this experience fantastic uh, and and bring it in your games and I was saying you know that y you don't you don't automatically have to buy something what, what you need is first to to be able to play love it and then you 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 can want to to pay for it but so that's that's my feeling i would say but it's more the experience uh, itself that we have to bring yeah to players absolutely uh just a couple more for you i so we're we're coming to the start of another new console generation you guys always like to get in there early as we talked about um how important do consoles remain to Ubisoft? We just you were just today at mm -hmm. at, uh, at Google's keynote for for Stadia. So, uh, is that cloud powered future? Is, is that the future? Are the consoles the future? Can is does Ubisoft see both as being as coexisting? Where where do you see the industry going? We see we see both coexisting, um, but we are always extremely excited excited when. We, we see we can create um, worlds that are more interactive, where uh, you will have characters, NPCs, uh, that will be extremely intelligent, that where um, you will have systems that will uh, work one with the other, and, and that you can be able to play on all devices and continue, you know, you start on one machine, you continue on another right. one. All those things are really cool. And uh, as I said earlier, our teams can take more risk because players will try what they do. Right. So it's more difficult when you have a machine that has been there for five years. You already 
are used to a certain number of experiences and you try new ones, but it's only 20% of your time. On the new technology, it will be 100% of your right. time. So that's, that's what we love uh, at Ubisoft. So you're, you're ready for the new consoles then? We, we are full speed on you're it. Ready, I love it. I love hearing that. Um, on that note, what, how, much, how much input, if any, do Nintendo, Sony, Microsoft come to, to you about when, when they're uh, finalizing their new console plans? Oh, it's we, we <clears throat> first we sometimes uh, our engineers work with their engineers to to collaborate um, and and decide you know and push for our engineers are pushing for new possibilities that those consoles can bring. So there's a good um, relationship between the the teams before the console um, is is created, I would so say. So your teams are able to kind of give feedback on, on the, the technology they they need exactly. to the platform holders. Yeah, and before it's done, you know, before they set all the, the elements, we, we push for uh, new things. Uh, right. So so it's that's we have that collaboration. After we, we have, okay, what kind of products can you create or do you plan to do that will take advantage of those technologies? Love it. Uh, last question I have for you. So, what? This is a generic, dumb question, but it's a good with with you at, at the top of Ubisoft. It's a good question to ask. I think what 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 does the next five to ten years of Ubisoft look like? I mean, if all goes well, what's where is the company in that time, and and where are you? I mean, if you've probably earned the right to to go retire to a beach somewhere, how long do you want to to keep to keep running the company for before you you take your well earned uh, retirement, I'm sure. It's too much fun, so you know, you never <laughs> want to leave that. Well, good. Uh, no, what what we want is uh, to continue to progress and do better than uh, the, the 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 teams outside that we admire, um, and we we are happy with the progress we are making. But only gamers know uh, if we are on the right track. But we are working hard and trying hard to to create the the, the optimum experience. For players, do you want to be? Do you want to be the number one publisher on the planet? Is that a? Is that a? Yeah, no. Does that fuel you? What we want is to create the best experiences possible, and if it takes us to number one, mm -hmm. it will. It will do. But the the most important thing for us is to be um, recognized for bringing something that uh, people speak about for years and even twenty years after they. They come to me and say, oh, I remember that game was fantastic and it helped me to, to find my way. That's the, the best compliment for us. Wonderful. Yves Guillemot, thank you so much for your thank time. You. Uh, Yves Guillemot, the president, the CEO, the co-founder, the chairman of Ubisoft. Uh, he's very excited about the new consoles. Uh, we're, we're hopefully going to hear about Splinter Cell at some point during those years, too. That's that's me talking. <laughs> but uh, thank you so much for coming in. Thank you really for appreciate me. the time. And for more from the best, brightest, most fascinating minds in the games industry, be sure to check in with IGN Unfiltered every month. You can find it on IGN, on YouTube, or your favorite podcast service.